Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. Stratford-upon-Avon is most famous for being the birthplace of William Shakespeare, who penned the classic plays Romeo and Juliet, Macbeth and Hamlet, and is widely regarded as one of the best writers of all time. Although not much is known about the intimate details of the bard's life, records show that he was both born and buried in Stratford-upon-Avon, and many of the town's most popular tourist attractions today are connected to Shakespeare in one way or another and he is buried inside the Riverside Holy Trinity Church. I was lucky enough to visit Stratford and Holy Trinity Church a few years ago, so I was able to get a good look at Shakespeare's funerary monument that sits on the left side wall above his resting place. It features an image of the bard carved in limestone, holding a pen and paper. Shakespeare is buried, along with his wife Anne Hathaway, in the chancel, the part of the church near the altar. The stone slab that sits atop the bard's grave bears the rather foreboding inscription, Good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear, to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. This inscription on his tomb might have been included to prevent his remains from being removed and placed in a charnel house with other exhumed skeletal remains, which happened frequently in the days before cremation, when churchyard burials were still common and space needed to be cleared in the overfilled burial grounds and churchyards for new arrivals. Some historians also believe that the curse might have been included to prevent Shakespeare's body from being removed and interred in Westminster Abbey, where many other notable figures have traditionally been buried. But would you dare to break the curse inscribed upon Shakespeare's tomb? I certainly wouldn't, but according to legend, not everyone was deterred by it. Legend has it that, tempted by the riches that could come from the sale of the skull that once housed one of the greatest mines in all of England, a group of grave diggers set off on a mission to retrieve it. However, they would do well to remember that all that glisters is not gold. The gentle hum of laughter and conversation filled the air as Frank Chambers finished off the last of his dinner. Captain Fortescue sat beside the young doctor's apprentice. Across from the reverend, and to the left of Dr. Parr. It was quite the turnout, and the chatter from the table alone had made the place seem as though it were filled with double the patrons. The meal had been pleasant, although the service wasn't quite as speedy as it had been on Chambers' previous visits. The after-dinner conversation flowed and meandered across the usual topics, current affairs, the latest news from France, and Mr. Miller's ill health. The men then began to reminisce about the Shakespeare Jubilee, that had been held in Stratford some years prior, and discussion soon turned to the Bard of Avon. Captain Fortescue supposed that it would be impossible to assess how accurate the monument was in its depiction of the Bard, particularly the more notable features of his face. This discussion went on for some time, before Dr. Parr, who had spent much of the evening silent, with a large napkin tied around his neck, and eyes for nothing other than the contents of his plate, finally spoke up. The doctor suggested, in his distinctive lisping timber, that if Fortescue was so set upon discovering what the bard looked like, then he'd best dig him up himself. The men laughed, before Squire Moore remarks that after the Shakespeare Jubilee of 69, old Horace Walpole had actually offered a young man 300 guineas if he could bring him the skull of William Shakespeare. Another round of laughter started up, and eventually the conversation moved on. But as Frank Chambers stumbled home that night, he could not shake the visions of Shakespeare, his skull, and those 300 guineas that danced around his head. It was some time later then, at the beginning of autumn 1794, that Chambers met with three men at his home in Ulster. The men had come to Chambers on the pretense of picking up medicine for their wives. However, the only bottles exchanged that night were of an alcoholic nature. Cull, Dyer, and Horton had undertaken business for Chambers before, as the trainee doctor, who was keen on advancing his medical knowledge and understanding of human anatomy, needed a little help in acquiring some suitable subjects for study. And though Chambers lived but a stone's throw away from the large Ulster churchyard, it was a little too public for the kind of nocturnal activities he had planned. Therefore, it was for that purpose that Cull, Dyer and Horton assumed they had been summoned for that evening. However, Chambers presented them with a rather unusual proposition. I require something a little different from you this time around, gentlemen, said Chambers, as the group worked their way through the first round of drinks. A skull, 
he finished, setting his glass down daintily upon the table. Cull and Dyer caught one another's eye. Not just any skull, of course, Chambers continued. The skull of a chap who has been dead for nearly 200 years. The request was not too different from the usual sort then, thought the trio of resurrectionists. Digging up an ageing skull would certainly be easier and altogether less messy than their usual job snatching some of the fresher ones. What do you want a skull for? said Horton, pointing over to Chambers' mantelpiece. You've got one over there already. It looks about a thousand years old. Chambers nodded and turned back to face his mantle skull. Precisely, he said. I wish for another to keep him company. The men listened intently as the instructions were given, and the fee of three pounds apiece was agreed upon for a successful retrieval. And so, a few days later, the work began. Chambers hurried over to the church in Stratford under the cover of night. It was so dark out that he tripped over a footstone near the west door and cut his nose. Cull and Dyer were already at work, and Horton was shoveling dirt from the bottom of a new square tomb on the south side of the churchyard. Chambers half shouted at the men when he saw them deep in dirt and asked what on earth they were doing. He required the skull of one William Shakespeare, who was buried inside the church. They were digging up the remains of a well-known Stratford man who had died just a few years ago. Chambers demanded the men return the soil and quickly. Time was running out. The church door was soon jimmied open and, tools in hand, the crew made their way over to the chancel. Chambers squinted, trying to identify which of the stone slabs belonged to the bard. Horton waited outside as a lookout, whilst Dyer and Cull, lit only by the orange flame of their lanterns, worked together to raise the stone. The sound of the men chipping away in the gloomy silence was haunting. Eventually, the stone was removed, revealing a thick layer of brown mould beneath it. The men dug down three feet before Chambers ordered them to put down their tools and feel for the skull in the dirt with their hands. Dyer and Cull dipped their palms into the grave and across loose fragments of bone until Cull let out a deep breath and exclaimed, I got him. After a few heart-stopping moments of twisting and pulling, the skull finally came loose. At last, Chambers was able to hold the skull of the famous bard in his hands. And as he did, he glanced over to the limestone monument that now gazed down upon them with disapproving eyes. They looked nothing alike. There's a charnel house down the road that's filled to the brim with skulls of all shapes and sizes, remarked Cull, as he noticed Chambers paused in thought. We could have nicked one, even two, with about half as much fuss as this. Every man has his fancies, replied Chambers. This is mine. And with that, the men set about returning the stone slab to its former resting place. Each received his promised salary and more, which bought more than a few rounds of ale at the pub. Farewells were exchanged, and Cull, Dyer and Horton disappeared into the night, leaving Chambers to decide what was next for poor old Shakespeare's skull. Chambers met with Mr. Walpole, who had originally expressed an interest in the skull. However, he was only interested in loaning the skull from Chambers, as he was all too aware of the consequences of owning such a stolen artifact. Chambers retracted his offer and tried once more to sell the skull to a man who greatly admired Shakespeare. Perhaps he would like to own the ultimate memento of his idol, thought Chambers. But the man was upset by the thought of the skull going missing, and he reminded Chambers of the famous words inscribed upon his tomb, Cursed be he that moves my bones. And some might agree that, in one way or another, the curse did perhaps come true, but Chambers was never able to sell the skull that he had gone to such lengths to acquire. Dyer offered to rebury it, but he struggled to move the headstone and accidentally cracked part of it, which startled him so much that he abandoned the attempt altogether. And he never did let on to what he did with the skull after that. So, was Shakespeare's skull ever returned to its original resting place? Or is it still out there, upon a mantelpiece somewhere, or concealed within a charnel house gathering dust? Well, the bard himself said it best. Time shall unfold what plated cunning hides. Who covers faults at last with shame derides. So, that was my adaption of How Shakespeare's Skull Was Stolen 
rather mysteriously authored by an individual known only as a Warwickshire man, a cryptic moniker that I absolutely love, and henceforth I shall now be known only as a Somerset woman. Now, the story I've just told you, I must admit, is fictional. A fun little tale written for the Argosy magazine, invoking many of the gothic tropes popular in literature of the time. However, there might be more truth to the Warwickshire man's tale than first thought, meaning that the events of this story have now crossed over into legend. Could Shakespeare's skull truly be missing? In 2016, archaeologist Kevin Coles and geophysicist Erica Utzi led an investigation into Shakespeare's tomb, which used a ground-penetrating radar to investigate the site without disturbing it. The key findings from this investigation, which were featured in the Channel 4 documentary Secret History Shakespeare's Tomb, revealed that repair work had been undertaken to the grave previously. Coles theorized that the work might have been brought about in response to a sinking of the floor, perhaps prompted by a previous disturbance to the grave. The investigation also revealed that Shakespeare and the other members of his family buried in Holy Trinity were not buried deep in a family vault, as previously had been assumed, but they were wrapped in a kind of shroud and buried in a shallow grave. The Argosy magazine story specifically references the tomb being three foot deep, a detail which at first glance could be brushed off as poor research from the story's author. However, after the GPR scan investigation, this detail turned out to be exactly correct, suggesting that perhaps the Argosy story was not as fictional as first thought. But why would anybody want to steal the skull? Well, some might have believed that owning the skull of Shakespeare might invoke or transfer some of his genius unto themselves. Or it might have been stolen for study by those practicing the pseudoscience of phrenology, which would involve examining the bumps on the skull to see whether they revealed any clues about Shakespeare's talent for writing. Or, of course, like Chambers in the story, the skull could have been sold to a private collector for a great sum of money. An addition to the original story suggests that after failing to sell the skull and return it to the grave, Dyer is supposed to have hidden it in a vault over in Burley. And though a skull was actually found in the vault, it unfortunately did not belong to the bard. So this raises the question, if the skull is truly missing, then where is it now? Well, as yet, we don't know. The church is still very reluctant to accept any requests to exhume Shakespeare's remains, and indeed, the curse written on the tombstone is very clear about what might happen to those who attempt to move the bard's bones. So for now, it seems that this legend will remain a mystery for the foreseeable future.